All right, guys. So thank you guys for coming back. Night part two of 20. Boom. Any any ahas from last uh, Wednesday when it came to mission, vision, values, belief systems, perspectives, the six personal perspectives, ahas from our daily 1010 and, and so forth? Um, I, daily 1010s. Mm -hmm. First of all, I wished I had something, a piece of paper I could write my tip notes on that would have made life easier. Yes. Um, but I also found that it wasn't as hard as I thought to mm -hmm. do because, you know, like, and I thought, oh God, that social media stuff. <laughs> you know? But like doing 10, you know, likes takes but a minute, yep. you know, yeah. and exactly. comments could be, oh, you look great, or, you know, <laughs> whatever beautiful house, or, you know, whatever the case might be, mm -hmm. super easy. Um, what, what was the one? Just make a post. Uh, yeah, the post that, that might take a little more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the other stuff and you know the daily context and stuff, and I thought it's very good for us all to be mindful about that, right? Right. Now because business isn't so easy to come by, so you know we need to make sure we're doing those activities. Absolutely. And while we uh, we might just easily think, yeah, I do that every day, but. It's different when you're actually putting the tip mark down. You know, <laughs> it's, it's more mindful and you get more done. Yeah, there, there's something right out of the one thing Gary talks about discipline, but not being disciplined forever. You're disciplined for a short period of time until what you're being disciplined about becomes a habit. Right now, I'm not saying scrolling through Facebook is pretty easy to create that habit. Maybe you get stuck into that black hole. But you know, when being doing something like that on purpose or making 10, having 10 conversations in a day. And making that discipline, it's two forty-five. Man, on my ninth conversation or my ninth contact, okay, well, push yourself to get one more before you get the kids out of school, right? Or whatever, whatever that is. Um, and then you kind of find ways to to grow that. And then what 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 started off as a hard thing to keep track of is now very natural. Now it's for me, it's more natural to have 15, 16, 17 conversations in a day. And I figure the math, okay, my first and ten, that's a built-in two, three conversations. My hour of power, that's a built-in four or five conversations. My follow-up, that's another two, three conversations. And then my return call is another three, four conversations. So by the end of the day, it's what felt like at the very beginning, like a ton of work is now just, oh, 30 minutes here, an hour here, 30 minutes there, and you can grow that. And you can rattle all that off because you started out being mindful and counting, and now you know. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. You, you can keep your little sheet. I had a tracker here, and like, not on this page, not on this book, but I used to keep a tracker one through 100. And at one time, it took me, like, I, I would hold on to that sheet until I hit 100 contacts. And it used to take me three weeks to get to 100 contacts, right? Now you get to 100 contacts, it's usually either that same week, seven day period, or maybe a couple days after. You know, I'll just restart it every week when, whenever I would want to track it. But 100 contacts can go by pretty quickly when, when all you do is you're just living your life and you just kind of plug in where you meet people. And, and those who open houses, man, all you're doing is nothing but making contacts on, on, in that situation. So if you feel like, hey, I'm not making my contacts 10 a day or 20 a day, whatever the goal is. But you do an open house, you can make up for a, a, a Monday and Friday that you didn't have a lot going on, you know. So those are those are little hacks to kind of make that happen. And especially if you network a lot, you know, the networking aspects like throwing a grenade in a room. You're now I'm not saying, hey, go to a large crowd, tell people you're in real estate. But when you're working a room and you're working one-on-one -on -one with people or in little groups or pods and you're changing cards, exchanging um, QR codes and all that stuff, your information, texting each other information. That's like a pool of just lead, of lead contact and potentially lead follow up there. You know, and networking played a huge role in my confidence in real estate, our resources. That's where we met a lot of our insurance agents and a lot of our, um, our lending partners at El Cariso and um, just different, different aspects, especially knowledge. You know, it just never ends. Um, that's great. Well, Cindy, thank you for that. Uh, anyone else would like to share maybe their goals or just some, something they picked up from last Wednesday or from just the other day? For me, it Erica. was just do it. Like, just do it. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> like get out of your comfort zone yeah. completely. Like mm -hmm. Luis is all about videos. I'm a fan, <laughs> but I did. That was my yes. video. My so video was a cover. My Woo! video. There you go. I did the 10, you know, the 10 mm -hmm. find one. That was like, this is easy, just 10, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. comment, like, you're like, oh, you're doing good. Oh, your house. I'm like, no. Yeah. It's already something to do. It was so, like, <laughs> I, like, like, I 
overthink too yeah. much. That's my problem. I, or, that's the challenge that I'm overcoming. I'm going to watch what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So I'm overcoming that overthinking thing. Yep. But what was so easy was, like you said, just be in your natural habitat and just do it like it's a normal life. So we were at track and my son was like, mom, uh, can I have your phone number to give to my friend? And here's his mom's phone number. I said, okay, so I'm scrapping around looking for people. And I'm like,
my mother-in-law uh, is looking to move here. Yes. So oh, hey, hey, yes. Turn, that, <laughs> turn that mind on, right? <laughs> Incredible. That, see, yeah, that is good. We're basically yeah. putting it out to the universe, just yeah. by sitting here. Yeah. 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 But you know, you condition this bad boy, everything else is kind of magnetized. It's weird to say, but yeah. the more you, um, study about 1031 exchange and all the nerdy stuff like everything about real estate you can't help but share what you know and then people kind of show up it's hard to train that the best way i can say it is if you're just consistent with your schedule you know breaks happen right because of the messages you're leaving the contacts you're making follow up on purpose um direct conversations the training aspect and writing down names of people to follow up with yeah, you know, it, it's just you're naturally going to develop those conversations throughout the course of your day, your week, and your month, and your career. Um, and in this case, it says embrace your job. It really should say embrace your career. Um, you know, in this case, we're, we're still a real estate expert. And then the key things we're going to be covering today, and this is where I go to teacher mode, huh? but it's um, apply the six core competencies of the business, recognize roles of fiduciary for clients. Review the success systems, recap Naha's daily success system. And then we're gonna kind of fly through this in a little bit. And the six core portions we're gonna cover relatively quickly. This isn't necessarily new things, but I wanted to, I would like for you guys to think of it from a new perspective, right? And these are things we may be doing already. A lot of us are doing number one, lead generate, capture, and convert to appointments, present to buyers and sellers and get agreements, show buyers and market, um, show buyers and market sellers. And we're going to do some deep dive conversations on these. And I'm going to come from the perspective of how I was before we had a team, before we started growing an administrative team, and then now with an administrative team, if that makes sense. Write and negotiate contracts, coordinate the sale to closing, and manage the money. Um, real quickly here, who, who here lead generates? Um, just regularly, just we all. Oh, I, I, I have a lot of lead follow-up. That's how I get my point. Yes, that too. <laughs> um, so when it comes to lead generating, that is really just an effort of time blocking. Um, Lisa did an amazing job the other day of breaking down what she does in terms of lead generation. That was on Thursday morning, yesterday morning. Um, and the idea is you, you can literally say, hey, I'm going to lead generate five of my SOI. Make five calls. And then I'm going to take 45 minutes and call you know, expired listings or for sale by owner or, or cold call around. And also here's another, not in the book, but cold call, replace cold call with gold call, oh, right? Yeah, you know, you're, you're, you're making a gold call, right? I mean, literally if someone connects with you and you connect with them, you choose to work with them, not them choosing to work with you, but you choose to work with them. That's in this market, a $22,000 paycheck. And I was just doing the math, 900,000 at two and a half percent, whether buy or sell. Um, that's 22,500, you know, whatever, and then whatever, our, I think we're all on the same split and all that stuff. So off we go, you know, so that's 22,500 that goes right in terms of GCI right over to you. So every time you're making that phone call and you're just going through the name, you see that it's not in a trust or in a trust, you're just connecting with that person. And it's not an hour or four hours. Louisa said it best, out of an hour, you're probably getting a true 45 minutes of productive call time out of it. And then there's these little breaks in between, take a breather, use the restroom, you know, whatever. Get, get in a conversation with one of your teammates here. Um, but you're, you're, you're basically blocking off some parts of your day to make those calls, right? Now, the cool thing is lead generation isn't a 12 hour thing. Right, captured and convert to appointment. So part of that of that portion of whether it be two hours or four hours, and I think four hours is more than enough time. You know, you get into an hour with your first top 10 calls that you must make. I mean, these are the ones who you need to return calls from the day before. These are the ones that, oh my gosh, I thought of this person. I want to call them. Hey, this person reached out to me on Facebook. Now I'm gonna reach out to them all over the phone. Those are your top 10 must-have calls. So if you, all of a sudden you got an emergency and you need to go to your kid's school because your kid fell off the monkey bars, you know, I don't wish that upon you. I'm just, that's just an example. <laughs> but, you know, at least that first hour, that first 45 minutes, man, you made your top 10, right? Count that as a W. If you have a second hour, I would work what's called an hour of power. That's more of those gold calls. And that could be your database. That could be right into maybe the farm that you got from the title rep. Um, I don't know, or any of the other resources you're using, um, you can call around that. And if you want to be super specific, 
I would even look at um, getting a call list from your kid's school, right? Of all the professional people, not not just the classroom where you're now it's like a bunch of work. Yeah, but you, you know, call, get all the, the professional people, you know, all those, you know, we all have banners in front of our school, right? Take a picture of it or get the, the roster of all the professional people and go business, business networking, right? And that could be your gold call. It doesn't have, it's not totally cold, it's definitely gold, and you have a warm relationship there. Um, there's this app called Alignable. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. Um, they're having a, a seminar at the Sagebrush Cantina on the 26th, and everyone's invited from 5.30 to 7. I sent some emails out to whoever I had on my email list, but it's about business to business, and the lady's going to show how to use the app and all that. And I'm not sure what else is involved, but I think it's going to be pretty cool. Oh. What is it? Uh, 426 um, at a 5.30 or 6.30. Uh, 5.30 to 7. What's it called? Uh, Sagebrush. Uh, alignable. 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 It's a business to business app. And it's oh, usually yeah. in local, like for the local area. I get like emails from them. Me too. Yeah. yeah. So and so wants to align with you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> what does that mean? I'm like, well, I don't know. But it's like a business, yeah. Right. I get that. It's kind of cool because I've gone to a couple of attorneys that wanted to exchange. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Uh, it, does people leave? I think we hear the word door knock and cold call and think, oh man, it has to be like a complete stranger for us to attract business. But if we have at least this much of, of room to connect with someone, like our kids go to Chime Charter School, great. You know, I can connect with those business people on that one little thread and say, hey, I'm, our kids go to the same school. I'm a, we might actually know each other, who knows? But one of those things where I can make those phone calls, connect with them, go business to business. Hey, if there's someone I know who can help, who could be benefited, benefited from their business is awesome, and then vice versa. And I, and I know going in, I'm not going to be immediately the number one or number two person in their head, but I know I'm going to come from a place of contribution, and I know I'm going to be able to work my way into earning that, that position. Like you said, there was a title rep that you worked with for years, and it's like they got super complacent, and there was someone else that you started working with who was just like on the spot, delivering 100% or above and beyond. It was a no-brainer, hey, I'm going to send my, my listings over over that person's way. Mm -hmm. It's no different when working with other people. Just because we made the contacts, we generate the lead and capture the lead doesn't mean that we're their number one person off the bat. Right. right. We're going to earn that through follow-up, through being through our training growth, through our resourcing consulting, all that fun stuff. We're going to be the top person there. Hey Nicole, thanks to yeah. Everyone, Nicole. Hey. Hey. I was working on Zoom. Oh, sorry. You know what? It was on Zoom, and then I was on the wrong. I was on the wrong Zoom. Okay. That, was, that was on. Zoom. Well, you got me in here anyway. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> and then we go into converting to appointments. Now, this is where the rubber meets the road a little bit. So, the converting to appointments is the fun part. It, it's more or less assessing where that person is at, and the this is usually the the sound of an appointment starting. Well, Louisa, you know, I would like to, to go ahead and, and buy a house. What, where do you think I should start? <laughs> and, and, you know, quite honestly, with buyer appointments, I'm kind of 50-50 on whether to meet them right away or start them on the pre-approval with the lender, mm -hmm. right? It, it's, for me, I found it a lot easier, and they're more open to meeting the lender, confessing all their financial information. Lender tells me, fill up they're qualified for 400000 they want to buy a house. Well, hot dog, I'm going to get into California City. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's kind of one of those things where a buyer consultation can almost be a therapy session, right? So as much as we can, pre-qual over the phone, right. maybe connect them with the lender. Now, I leave it to you guys to decide what to do. Early on, I took the appointments because I just needed the, the experience. I wanted to ask the questions. I didn't mind the appointments being an hour and a half, two hours of my day. Sometimes they're only 30. Now they're only 30 minutes, yeah. 20 minutes. But a lot of times back then, I just did it so it's like a happy experience. Right. So there's no right or wrong here. Yeah. You know, if you if you feel like, hey, you can dedicate the time and, and extract what you need to extract and, and learn what you need to learn, thumbs up. Um, I, I prefer that they, we cover as much on the phone, like, hey, if you were to, to find a home, what's ideal for you? Mm -hmm. Awesome. What is an ideal um, monthly budget for you? 
than when we're only talking about paying the principal, your interest, taxes, and insurance all in one shot. Wow, Philip, I never, I never thought about that. Um, I might need to talk to my fill in the blank, whatever, right? My partner, my spouse. Oh, yeah, hey, I didn't know you were married. Great. That's but stuff you have maybe a phone call conversation or a Zoom call with your wife on the phone with us or on, on the appointment with us. Yeah. So you're really finding out. You know, a lot of this stuff starts coming out when stuff, you know, they say well, when shit gets real, right? Yeah. You know, the, when stuff gets real, now all of a sudden they're like, well, I mean, I got to talk to my other decision maker. I got to talk to my mom because she's giving me the money for this. I got to, mm-hmm. you know, now it's it's like bubbling up. That's when you know you're getting closer to an appointment. Now the listing side, set the appointment. <laughs> <laughs> set the appointment, cover as much, as much ground over the phone as possible. The other decision maker, if any, their goal for the net proceeds, what value do they have in mind, or are they leaving it to us, but try and get a value from them. Because a lot of the pre-approval questions that we ask for, we want that as much as possible before going into the appointment. And that's all from, you build these habits from just making regular lead generation calls and follow-up. Because so we're constantly being detectives about their goals, mm-hmm. about some of the challenges they're, they're going through, and the more we ask questions and the more we listen, the more they, they talk. And like we said before, everyone's favorite conversation is themselves. And the more we ask them, the more they're like, oh, hey, Erica's calling me. I'd love to take her call. Yeah, but, you know, that's right. And anytime yeah. my mom calls me, she's just telling me what to do. Erica asked me how my day's going. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, there's, this ongoing, <laughs> there's this ongoing thing when it comes to um, building that relationship with people on the phone. Oh. I'll see here. I, I want to piggyback on yeah. on the buyer's um, consultation. Absolutely. Fill them out. I've never done my buyer's consultation in one way. Mm-hmm. Like I've always filled them out um, doing my buyer's um, questionnaire on the phone, right? And so, if for instance, if they're like from Op City, then I know for a fact okay, they need to meet like now is that. So then I would do my buyer's consultation. When I show them the property, oh, right? That's your point. That's so a then, jump ball situation. right? Exactly. So then I would do, but I wouldn't make it like, okay, here's your buying buyer consultation. But it was more of like a discussion, a conversation, and then from there, and then that's why you need to know your script. You need to know the importance of what needs to be asked on that buyer's consultation because even if we doubt it, like you can still have the conversation, and then. For them not to feel like, oh, this is like an interview. Like, and then you know how like new agents are like, well, I don't want to sound like so sweet. Well, if you you memorize it, you internalize it, and then you make it your own, right? Then it's not gonna be saucy. It's not gonna be an interview, it's more of a conversation. Right. So I've done my buyer's acknowledgement like different many ways. Oh, yeah. Either one, actual like, hey, let's meet up. That I'll buy you coffee, blah, blah, blah. Or, hey, I'll meet you at the property, even though I haven't talked to them about their lenders or anything like that. I'll meet you at the property, especially if it's a lease. That's how I do my buyer's consultation. And then I let them know, like, by the way, so I'm going to go ahead and send you a a form that's saying that you're hiring me to be a real estate agent. And that we're going to be working neck to neck. And that's the priority, right? And then they'll be like, yeah. You know, then you and then you have to ask that question, like, so does that mean that you're hiring me as your agent? Like, yes, okay, perfect. I'm gonna send it over to you. That's, that, those are great key points, and it goes right yeah. into present the buyers and sellers get agreements because the agreement, especially in this changing market, is gonna be golden, right? We're we're shifting potentially into a neutral market right now. A seller's market is six months of inventory or less. So even though homes are sitting for let's say even 28 days, that's still you know seller's market, right? Mm-hmm. Um, However, when we get to a point where there's a, a neutral market is when it, you have an equal balance for more than six months, then you're neutral and then you flip right into a buyer's market when homes are sitting longer than six months at a time, right? And then that's when, you know, as listing agents, being very specific on the details of the home matter because now the buyer may potentially have dozens of homes to choose from and a, a really good buyer's agent will base their top five showings or top six showings on commission. Kidding. <laughs> 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 Won't be the one percenters, right? <laughs> but it, it, you know, it may be one of those things where they base it. I know on MLS you can't search commission anymore, but likely commission will be a thing, right? The features and benefits of the home that a client specifically is looking for Right, those are the things that will really stand out. 
And so having the buyer's representation exclusive, building those muscles now, or you've been getting them the last, you know, the last couple months or last couple years, that's going to be the new listing agreement. It's a listing agreement now, but it will be like the same way we treat a listing agreement. That's what the BRE will be. And also, I, it also sets you free a little bit. If you get the BRE signed, and the only, and especially in this market, the only time you can show homes is during the <coughs> open house, right? Send them. Go play with your kids and let them go to five, five or six open houses, you know, on their own. And you're good with the BRE. Now we take a step further, you know, with Gabby and, and or with our clients, and we have someone go with them. But you know, we, we have other clients who just go on their own. And they have our business cards, the business card acts as their passport. They leave it with the agent and say, Hey, if you have any questions, please call my realtor. You know, otherwise they're they're scouting the house and all that good stuff. A quick question. What if they do not want to sign? Ah, great question. So on the BRE, it is okay. I've had those clients too, and ultimately we still sold them homes and we, we built great relationships after the fact. Um, I leave it to you guys to make the decision. And if they're using like several agents, uh, yeah, I cut them at off. At that point, okay. yeah, I, yeah, we just I had to do that once. I cut them off. I'm like, you know, I'm so sorry. Like, mm -hmm. I'm a, you know, I'm, I totally understand where you're coming from, but I'm a professional. And like, why would you need me if you already have five other agents? Because we're all going to show you the same <laughs> set of houses. Yeah. Yeah. At that point, we just give them right. Yep. And we have Christine far away. Hey there. I was just going to tell you something funny because I'm listening to you guys. Yes. And I, I agree with um, Louisa about getting rid of them. So Kurt and I kind of have this thing. If I have some clients and I set them up with access to the MLS and then we're sending them stuff and and whatever's happening, we're not we don't have the buyer's agreement or something and I'm not working with them or they're just whatever looky loose. There is a really great satisfaction. I get go delete. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Delete their access, you know, and I'm like, you know what? No, I, I give it to a certain point, or I will use it to come back and say, hey, you know, I know, like, I want them to know that I know. And hey, in a nice way, I saw you're here, you know, have you decided to come back in or, you know, blah, blah, blah. But there's something about that little delete that I really like. Yep. 100%. I can't, I can't agree with you guys more. And like we were saying earlier, you select who you work with, right? It, it didn't a jerk off and they want to work with you refer the business out and take a 50 50 on it right or 25 75 whatever you know the deal is you know there's an agent who referred a client he's from Paso Robles referred a client out here in Montebello we had connected a mega camp and connected on Facebook but um you know he's getting a 30 percent referral fee you know our team's taking 70 and it's not 25 75 but good for him so 30 percent right um so if you Want to play the mafia game a little bit, be the godfather, the godmother of the people you meet and connect them. So they'll take a little, you know, we're all licensed, so it's okay to negotiate, right? So all, all in fun. Um, show buyers and market sellers. This is always fun. Um, now, I, I, I can do a deep dive on this on just one class. I'd probably end up having Maureen eventually teach it when, when her schedule's a little freer. Um, but when it comes to showing buyers, the, the consultation is so key. And finding out what their must-haves are. You know, what are their five must-haves? What are their five must-avoids? Right. So when we're getting the buyer agreement, it's not just, hey, we need to solidify a relationship. And by the way, when you read through the BRE, it covers two things that we never, you know, we didn't actually get a chance to talk about. Number one is is um, insurance. Our insurance covers them the moment the BRE is signed. So if there's some crazy stuff that happens, even without a deal being done or being signed, our insurance covers them. Right, our personal insurance and the office insurance. In other words, that's why I mean, when we signed up with, with, with the brokers, they're like, "Hey, you need like three hundred thousand dollars of additional insurance." Well, why is that? Well, for that case, in case something happens to the client or whatever. Number two, there's actually a conversation that I that now I'm thinking about. This is what I have with the client. Um, this is there's a portion that talks about commission being paid, right? Mm -hmm. And we actually say in there that the commission being paid is all through multiple S M L S. Right, cooperating broker compensation, all that stuff. Now, there's a tag on there that says, "Hey, if we, if there's a property that doesn't offer compensation through MLS, this is what my services cost." And I put in there five percent. Right now, most people are holy crap. That's a lot of money. Well, hopefully, we find the house on MLS, Philip. Okay. You got it, John. <laughs> but then, when the question comes up about the one percenters and the uh, off market and the for sale by owner, and hey, Philip, I found this on whatever. Great. I know I can have a conversation with them about the 5%. Now, is it 5%? No. 
you know, we, we've done it for two and a half percent, right? Or 3% or 1% in some cases, but we had that conversation early on and we got them to pay us even though it wasn't on MLS, right? And now you're having a strict business conversation, a financial conversation with the client, and now your value is being presented there. Because a lot of times it's like this weird fog that we don't talk about. You know, we, in the back of our head, we know whatever is 2%, 2.5%, 3%, 4%, whatever is being paid, new construction side or otherwise. And this is an, an opportunity. So now they've kind of seen a little bit of the value. Now it's attaching the value to a number. Right, and that's where the that BRE conversation comes in, and a thousand percent going back to if they don't sign it, but they're working with a ton of people, <clears throat> yeah, you drop them or put them on on the timeout corner, mm -hmm. um, or you know, like, okay, let's go out, take them out for five houses, let's write offers, and let's get them under contract. Mm -hmm. Right, I've done all three. <laughs> We've had them sign. We haven't had them sign. We let them go. Right now, after a while, they're really just a month in. They haven't signed anything, and we've gone out like four weeks in a row. Or there's something, there's something going on there, you know. But I, again, we're all entrepreneurs. We're all business owners. We we leave it to our better judgment. We go from there. Show buyers, market sellers, marketing sellers. We're we're not going to get into that totally. Um, oh wait, Christine, go ahead. Or your hand just raised. Okay, cool. Um, market sellers, so that's where we get to leverage. Um, a lot of us just kind of take that to make our gold calls, go invite to the open houses. Um, I think we shared an idea the other day, like when we're inviting to the open house, give them a heads up about the neighborhood being swamped with cars because, hey, this is a home that's going to go pretty quickly. Just want to let you know if somebody you feel is, is you know, leaving trash in your front yard because they're, they're coming around or they're standing on your grass or blocking your driveway. Here's my information. Please call me. Let me know so we can inform them to get off of your property as soon as possible, right? <laughs> so that's that. Right to negotiate contracts. So this is, who, who here has attended that class I, I did a while back about writing offers in less than two minutes or just having your templates done? Yeah. So we'll do a follow-up to see that. Yeah, you have a template, there you go. But having templates for, I, I don't have one for leases, but I do have one for buyers for the, for the RPA and then one for sellers for the listing agreement. And that will save you a ton of time. As much time as we spend showing homes or marketing houses or getting ready for appointments, just having a basic template will literally allow you to write an offer in two minutes. I'll get back on the calendar with Andrew and with um, Tammy of when we can do another one. Um, and I'll double check. I, I believe he uploaded it to the KW Calabasas uh, estate site on YouTube. So, but if, if we want to do another live one, we'll, we'll work on getting that on the books. Um, coordinate the sale to closing. And this is another topic on this. Um, time, find the schedule for the calendar. Whenever Rich does a contract class, whenever someone's teaching a zip form class, pop in for that. Even as a refresher, Rich, yeah, Rich Bassani. I think um, Jeff Kahn is doing another one on the RPA um, next week, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. So that's going to be on Zoom as well. And that's a good one to jump in on. Um, coordinate the sale to closing. Now, this is where I, I'm going to just give you the, hat, the, the cheat sheet on this. Hire a TC. 1,000% hire a TC. Now, the TC doesn't do everything for you, right? It sure does a lot. Yeah, it does a lot, though, like 90%. Sure <laughs> But I'm going to give you the five things that a TC doesn't do. This is where, and this will lead into our next conversation to get the new Sherry. It's writing and negotiating the contract to open escrow, right? Um, scheduling the home, all the inspections, presenting the disclosures, meaning helping them understand what the TDS and SPQ is. Anything that has to do with the request for repairs, right? That's all, that's all us. And any amendment changes to the to the whole agreement to the RPA. Final walkthrough would be number six, and that's our top six things to do in a transaction. Some of that doesn't even involve us being there in person. If you want to avoid going into home inspection, I know a lot of our agents who don't. When I when I was a solo, just completely solo agent, I turned that into an opportunity for Facebook Live. I would interview the um, home inspector. I would interview the termite guy. I would go live when they're putting that camera right through the toilet plumbing line. And it was gross. And people would tune in to watch that. It's the funniest thing. I, I would have fun with that, with that appointment 
and I use it to return calls, get my added done, all that. Oh, and that's another one the seventh item added. Make sure when you're down there, pop it to do your agent visual. So those are the seven things to do, but I would turn the home inspection into that opportunity to just social media that bad boy, leverage it, make my return follow calls and do my happy. Well, Connect with my point. client. I lost track. So okay. write the offer negotiated into into um into an open escrow. Um so second inspections, reviewing the disclosures. Um, I got them all. Yeah. I think oh. number one, but number two was presenting disclosures, requests for repairs, amendment changes. Requests for repairs. I final walkthrough mm -hmm. and the habit that I get number one. So was number oh, um, <laughs> write the offer and, and open escrow. Oh. And then I guess writing the offer would include the, the seller most <laughs> <counter. laughs> or sorry, the buyer, the buyer counter offer, those basic items. Right. And when I say present the disclosures, it's really like I, I, I still read them. But when you go through the NHD report and you're buying something in Bell Canyon, there's like a big disclaimer that it's radio, potentially radioactive, that the nuclear waste side and all that stuff. You know, it's no. <laughs> but present those things to the client, give them a heads up. Hey, you're just, you may know this already. You're in a fire zone, Santa Clarita, near the Bell side. There, there's some uh, stuff in there, but I, I really just present the TDS and SVQ, the this, this stuff handwritten by the client. And I go over those key things. Hey, they're disclosing what we're literally about to find in, in the inspection report. Um, and one last hack, uh, you know how sometimes we end up doing the home inspection before we get all the disclosures, mm -hmm. right? If the disclosures come back and then they're, they're actually, there's actually stuff wrong with the disclosures and they kind of coincide with the, um, Home inspection, or especially if they don't coincide with the home inspection, you can actually extend that period, right? And give your lender some cover fire while we're trying to get the whole file done and all that fun stuff. So hopefully that was a good little step. Rachel, you there? I remember that their avid is is um attached to this as to the SPQ and TDS because without the avid, it's not a complete disclosure. Yeah. Then therefore you have another five days yep. to in, to look at. Uh, look at all the disclosures. So you'll be like, oh, well, well we have still have five days. Because if they call you, like, where's your contingency removal? I'm like, I still have five days. You didn't give me your attic. Yep. Right? 100%. So you, you need to know that like, those little quirks, and they, they know that you're not someone to act with. And they'll be like, oh, she knows the real. <laughs> <laughs> right? So when, like, when the listing agent don't, don't give me the avid, I let it be. I'm all like, cool, we have extra five days until we get this out it. So, you know, so then when they ask for the contingency removal, I'm like, no, we still have five days. Yeah. Like, and, where's your habit? I have Amina, five days to go over it with my clients. I, Amina and whoever you work with, they're, they're really pretty darn good at keeping the timelines together. Yeah. And so especially when we're in this market, we're going in without a loan contingency, without, and home. something comes out of left field that's totally out of everyone's control. It's like, well, thank God we can hit the exit button or extend it because of, of the, that clause. Mm -hmm. Well, I need to know about that part of line because then for the agents who don't know about it, I need to catch it and say, no, we have more time. No, 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 absolutely. Because it's one of those things where we have our partners and it's like, we got to cover them as much as they cover yeah. us. Right. And I also let, you know, I let one of our partners know, like, hey, we're going in without this contingency, but this is the thinking behind it. This is how, you know, for the most part, we have a fully underwritten file, but I get it. Everyone's like, whoa, whoa, whoa I don't know. Um, because of that shred of doubt, right? What 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 if something comes up? Yeah. So having explaining that to them, they understand, oh wow, this is really good. And the only agents who I ever see have a TDS and SDT ready to go is Danny Ross, Mike Galliotti, Stephanie Mitaco. Those are the three who Without a doubt, every single time. Luisa Ramos. Luisa Ramos. Oh, <laughs> my bad. My bad. Once you get your listing, I send it over to my, my clients right away. Here, fill this out because it's going to take you a long time to fill it out. I cannot help you with it. And oh, then by here, that time, I do my habit right so away. So here's an extra step. It's on the supplements. Yep. On the on the MLS update. Excuse me. Sorry. All right. So <laughs> on the right. Or sometimes like so right I've now we've only done it once. <laughs> so right now with, with with our Lancaster listing, we actually did a pre-inspection at Termite. And of course we told them, right, all the agents, and they're like, Oh, can you send us over the pre-inspection and the termite? So like, yeah, I'm like, no, I'll send it over once you send me over a great offer. Wow. 
I'm like, you're not going to get that for free. I, 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 we I, I, think, like, yeah. I throw it on supplements. And if they do the TDS, that's got to happen there. Yeah. But I'll tell you, those, those three um, agent center teams, they really they really have a machine going on. And there's probably others, but those are the ones who they have listings in kind of my client's price point. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of will see how they run things. I'm like, oh, pretty copy paste, but it's a very standardized operation, operating procedure, which I think is really cool. Yeah. Um, last one or set is manage the money and this is managing your money that comes in i i made the mistake oh shoot we got 15 grand let's go to disneyland you know so <laughs> hey i hit a goal but then i didn't i made the mistake of spending all, all of them <laughs> right or you know investing into things in the business way way too soon or feeling that oh i'm going to keep making this money right so there is this counterbalance of um, Steve called it feast and famine, and I don't think there's feast and famine in real estate. I think there's feast and famine in our activities, right? We go through a, a 90 day cycle of just crushing it, man, I'm lead generating every day, I'm lead following up, I'm converting, boom, mate. and then we stop because we're showing a ton of homes, we're listing properties, we're, we got a couple leads from it. So, hey, this is sustaining, we make a $40,000 payday, and then it's like, I stop for a month. So this is literally happening. I stopped for a month or two, and then I'm back on track because of forty thousand dollars kind of weighing after I paid my credit cards and all this stuff. Oh man, I'm back in that. I got to work, and then it's in in the course of a year. Instead of doing twenty four deals, I do like eight or nine because hey, that was that's how long it took to get on that off that cycle. So managing the money is really staying consistent on our, our activities. But when the money comes in. This is an easy barometer. Set aside 20% for your taxes, right? And I'm going to go into this whole thing about tithing money too, because it's not about tithing money. Um, it's 20% of taxes, 40% operating costs, 40% your, your lifestyle and savings, right? And then you can decide where you want to take the savings from, maybe instead of your operating expense, maybe 30% and take 10% and put it away to savings, and then 40% for your, for your lifestyle and building a bubble around that. Wait, right. say that again. Um, Twenty percent for taxes, ten percent savings, thirty percent operating expense, forty percent for your for your lifestyle. Or ten percent savings, thirty percent operating costs, and uh, for the lifestyle. Forty percent lifestyle. And what? then uh, oh. the oh. um the tax guy that came. Um, I don't know. I don't. Remember who he was, yeah, but you're talking about he lost a lot of weight. Yeah, yeah. 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 he said 30%. Right. Well, it depends on you have yourself set up. Uh, I mean, if you set yourself up as an S Corp and you're paying through payroll, then you're you probably get away with having a little bit lower. Um, but again, maybe go back and you can re revise how you want that set up. Um, there's different ones. I'm going off of a book called Profit First, and that's what we've been using oh. last year, give or take. Um, and that's saved our tail this year. We're actually getting a refund for the taxes, like holy mm -hmm. down, go figure. But um, 20% was kind of the number we used there. Um, but then we'll, now to think about it, we also pay taxes for our payroll. So then we're we're probably oversaving with all the write-offs and everything else. Um, Christine, go ahead. I couldn't hear the numbers. Could you just say those? I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And then Erica brought up a great point. Consult your CPA. Like we're, we're, the numbers I'm sharing with people are 20% for um, taxes, 10% savings, 30% operating expenses, and 40% for your lifestyle. Mine equaled 110%. Oh, did it really? Okay, right, so 40, 70, 30, no, yeah. 20 and 10. 40, yeah. yeah, it should be 20, 20 10, 30. 30. So, we, so we have 40 at lifetime, but at lifestyle, but it should be 30. No, no, operating should be 30. Operating. There you go. There yeah, operating, so yeah, lifestyle. 20, 10, 30, 40. What's the mortgage? Is that part of lifestyle? No, it's got to be in lifestyle. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's one of those things where $22,000 goes by pretty quickly yeah. you know, when, you, when you factor it all out. Um, that was a hard, hard, hard learning lesson for me. I was like, we made money, but where the hell is it? <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah, that was always fun. But then you're going to find ways that work for you. Like Gary Keller says, you should you should um, live off of 70, set aside 30. And then I figured in the 70, you're paying taxes and saving money. But then he said he, he and his wife, Mary, lived on the reverse. They, they saved away 70, lived off of 30%. 
right? And then they eventually started living, they're right now, according to them, they're living off like 5%. You know? And the, the idea behind that was where, where can we save in our budgets? Where can we get a refinance? Where can we pay off our debt faster? Where can we save literally thousands, right? When you when you knock off the little the little things. Um, now, there, people talk about tithing, you know, like tithing 10%. Look, early on, and I'm, I'm again borrowing this Gary Keller, his big thing was tithe your time. You guys are young, we're relatively young. We can tithe our energy, we can tithe our time. Steve Sass said it best our most precious commodity is time, right? Mike will make the argument that it's information. You know, I think that's too uh, time, I agree, is number one. So, tithing a portion of our time to whatever tugs at our heart or whatever moves us to, to give up that time and give up ourselves. Because think about it, we're realtors. Like we're not the bottom of the food chain. The people would like to treat us that way. We're the leaders in our circles of influence in our communities. We're, we're those pillars, right? So when we think of ourselves as the doctors and the attorneys of, of that field of, of our industry, our time truly is valuable. Like, and it's not just lifting sacks of rice and, and folding clothes for, for different things that we do. It's also this, the mind, right? It's that leadership factor that everywhere, everywhere it's missing. A lot of people love California. You know, it's like, you know, people got scared, cashed out, moved. There's a big leadership vacuum in so many different industries, especially at the nonprofit level. So when we show up in the nonprofit level, we're not just giving up our time, we're giving up of our brains, right? And I think that's more than the thousand bucks I can give them. Because to hire me to work for, the, for their nonprofit, it would literally cost them 20 grand a month. Because that's what I would ask for. That's why I asked the other team leader over there, and they, they want to give it to me, like, oh, we can't afford it. Oh, okay. I'll stay as a realtor. <laughs> you know, but that was, that was always fun. Um, so that's my little thing on tithing. Yes, donate some money when you can, but... Right now, early on, as we're building our businesses, it doesn't hurt to donate the time. Right? Mm -hmm. Mindset matters a little bit of that. We, we're recovering. To achieve your highest potential, these six core competencies must be done consistently and done well. And that's where the repeat business comes in. That's where the repeat opportunities come from, is being able to have something that is just done over and over and over again with improvement over that period of time. Any ahas from anything we've shared? I think there's a lot of that's a bounce those. But um, would anyone like to open up, whether on Zoom or here in the room, would like to share? I would like to ask if you guys, sorry, have any referrals for any CPAs for me next year. I'm changing mine, so if you have any. I'm, I'm signing up with Louie for yeah, 2022. I'm, I'm, Who is Louie the general? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm, you seem good. Yeah. Yeah. I, my guy just really helped me through a ton, but I know we're kind of like at the at the end or transition. So, but Louis will be my guy for, yeah. for next year. Doing, yeah, yeah, he's, he's, he's doing mine, but I mean, a little pricey, but I think it'll be worth it. Well, what's pricey though? Yeah. So. Well, he's doing like twenty two hundred. How much is twenty two hundred for a corporate? And but that's corporate plus personal. Personal. That's not too bad. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. No, I, I think yeah. I feel like I'm about the same because he's doing our corporate, my personal, my wife's, and then yeah. it ends up, yeah, give or takes about the same amount. But then but I he's, also. He's saving money for my business like, Oh, well, that's it. If he can right save money. Exactly. So he knows like all the things. So I don't mind paying it because my, um, unfortunately, my, the one that does it my, was my uncle in Dallas. So then, so I have to like find somebody and I'm, I've been, I'm like late from last year. So he's like, we can get you, we can actually get this except for you. I'm like, really? And I'm like, yeah. okay, you can do it. Yeah. <laughs> so there's some uh, some of our tax people. Like I was with the guy, he was super cool, Ray Guzman, and uh, he would do my taxes, and it was super easy because I never made any money. So I was like, whatever. Yeah. When I got into real estate, he was like, oh, hey, uh, Philip, just so you know, when you get to like a hundred thousand, I'm not going to do your taxes anymore. Right. You have to go to someone else. Like, oh. Crazy. Okay. So yeah. the year, well, he just doesn't, he doesn't deal with white offs or anything. Right. So the year I got to 100, a little, like 160, he, I bring it to him. He's like, Philip, uh, I won't, I won't tell you. You have to go to Mariana or you got to find somebody else. He was, he was genuinely adamant, but he knew 
kind of what his niche was. And it was just super simple to come in, file, mm -hmm. pay his 80 bucks or 70 bucks, and on to the next one. Um, so then I found Andy Guchin, killer dude. I just think when my wife and him meet, it's just so combative that it's like, man, it, this is the pit. Like, I need to find someone who my wife can actually work with. Yeah. I just, I can't. Like, even though he's great at what he does, yeah, he's I, awesome. just, I just can't communicate with this person that I have. Like, I can't, he's just, I can't. And my wife's like, he's worse than you. And I'm like, me <laughs> <laughs> and I did really well when you weren't on the appointments. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but then he's organized and like, oh, yeah. Well, he has like, so Lou, Louis is like the main guy, but then he also has the, um, what's his name? Gosh, I forgot his name. But he has like his, this one, like, he does like, He's like knows every little yeah. thing about taxes. Mm -hmm. So he's the one who like told me like oh, don't worry about it. Like real quickly before I totally forget. So I'm I should say I may work with Louie. Now I only throw this caveat out there. If you haven't hired a CPA, yeah. it's a perfect opportunity to work with a CPA who can have like a strategic partnership with you and referring clients. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So Louie, being that he's the grand wizard of, of, the, of this place, <laughs> um, he has a plethora of realtors to choose from. Okay. Thumbs up. But if in the course of your networking adventures and meeting people, meeting clients, if you meet someone who understands an S corp, understands real estate, and has a book of business that could be open to you, and you can say, "Hey, based on personality and need and match, this is who I am. This is how I do things." If you feel there's someone in your clientele world that I can benefit, and vice versa, please connect us. Right. And I think I can have that conversation with someone who's not Louie. And this is just me thinking out loud. Right. But um, you know. It, you also got to be strategic about that too. Mm -hmm. We're going to pay whatever we pay to do our taxes, but if I'm going to refer more people their way and they have people who, you know, someone dies in their family, they, like Steve said, they want to sell their house or look how to, how to lease it, we could be those resources for them. Right. Because we're the first people to find out about, about death and property, attorneys and, yeah. and accountants, insurance agents. How do you fire your previous one? Just don't look at me. It's on. <laughs> now we're going to oh, jump you. right into the fiduciary for being a fiduciary for your client yeah. versus a functionary. And then this is kind of cool. This is right, right out of the MREA. I'm going to just read it for how I have it here. Um, in the millionaire real estate agent, or, uh, sorry about that. Um, okay, in the millionaire real estate agent, Gary Keller explains a functionary is one who is specific has a specific task relationship with their clients. Um, while a fiduciary is one who not only does the task of the job, they are also in a high trust relationship with their clients and feel totally responsible for the outcome. This is important in real estate when people are making their most expensive purchase. So this is a step beyond just Zillow offers and Redfin, and, you know, hey, let me just show up and get the door. I know with um, Op City, it is kind of like a jump ball situation. It starts off as a functionary relationship where it's really, hey, when you go to the house, let me get the door. But like Louisa said, you immediately flip that script into a fiduciary role. And a lot of that is what we've covered today. It's asking questions, it's being a resource, being a consultant, finding out your goals, and then tying those goals to the market at hand and the resources they have at this moment. Um, now, this is also just real estate 101 when we, for me, renewing my license, for a lot of us just getting our licenses, you know how they have those scenarios about being ethical, being fair and open, be, be disclosing everything that comes to that comes to no knowledge. All of that is being a fiduciary, right? And when you think of when you think of a um, oh, I'm going backwards now. Oh no, no, we're not going backwards. We're good. Being the fiduciary, you're really just saying, "Hey, I'm not your lender. I'm not your CPA. Let's get those people involved in the transaction as need be." Right. So it's also calling stuff to the carpet that we don't have necessarily influence over, but asking them to bring those people to life. And that's, those are some great relationships to build as well, because being the fiduciary means bringing those other individuals who have better knowledge of that client's uh, assets and file to the table. Right. Um, now we're I, I have to, you're not going to like my opinion. No, no, far away. But, um, I hate when I'm in a um, escrow where one agent is representing both sides. Um, and the reason is because 
if, the, if things get a little sticky, mm -hmm. then I find that I'm the only one representing the buyer. Because mm -hmm. they start favoring one. Yeah, because yeah. the seller's paying them. So, you know, they, they're immediately like all over me, like, you know, I am. in a harsh way, if the buyer's side isn't going as smoothly as they like. And you know right. something, you're not the um, only one. I know there's ways to, to certainly navigate it and, and still make it the outcome that we look for, which is a win-win situation, or I call it a win-win-win-win situation. Uh, every, all parties, yeah. Um, there's actually a group of people who are trying to do away with dual agency. The only challenge is with dual agency, a dual agency exists even when Jessica is representing the buyer and representing the seller because we're from the same same brokerage, right? So if you do away with the whole dual agency, you kind of do away with, um, yeah. you know, basically realtors working for the same office. Now I get the agent aspect and there are horror stories of, of stuff going one way versus the other. I mean, there is, there's one case study. If you go to CAR, you can actually read all the chief's name on there. Like all the real <laughs> no, no, really, really. You know, like if you do something really bad, you yeah. know, you get shamed. You're actually put on their website with your photo, wow. and it actually wow. says what you did. Wow. <laughs> like, so you, you can That's go like on there. That's why don't do anything. Don't do it And you know, I was reading through that. It was pretty like, oh, I know this person. You know, like I wasn't surprised. I was yeah, I, I once had an agent who treated me really, really bad, and you put them on that site. It was funny because at first she was really nice to me. We were like going to get into a transaction. It was great. But once we got into the transaction, like he was like the Turned worst person just, ever. Yeah. And he treated me so bad. So I went to my coach and I was venting to him. And immediately he was just like, check out his mug shot. Like, uh, <laughs> like, all these like violations, yeah. just like everything oh, wow. was on there. It is all listed. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Very good to yeah. It's pretty wild. And now remember, we can't. Go around screenshotting and posting on social media. That, that's a big no-no. <laughs> but it, you're end up on it. yeah, you end up on it. You have to get your license for those or something yeah. like that. So it's pretty, you know. So you, you can read about that stuff. You just can't publicly mm -hmm. put that out there. And then there's some other stuff that came out a while back about. Uh, this has nothing to do with being a fiduciary, but you know, you can't as a realtor. You know how we have the First Amendment, freedom of speech, mm -hmm. right? There's certain things you just cannot say on, on Facebook. Yeah, there's no <laughs> yeah with, with, with a real estate license, it's quite the opposite. So I, I took this from Bud Morrow, 40-year um, legend in real, in real estate, longer. He's still, he's still around, awesome guy. He said, oh, you know, I'm at an age where I can post whatever I want. You, know, <laughs> you call me crazy, I'll post whatever I want. You, though, you cannot post anything. <laughs> he says, do not talk about religion, don't talk about politics. Don't talk about news trends. Don't share news trends. You know, and if you can avoid it, don't even like any of those posts. <laughs> and he was like, you know, oh, I noticed you like a lot of my posts, and I'm like, yeah, I think it's kind of cool. Well, Dude, for you, it's not cool. <laughs> it was really on me about that stuff. So it was one of the best tips of advice because I think when we get into that Facebook, Instagram, social media world, we kind of go wherever we go, um, and that's cool. Right, but he just what his lesson was just don't just don't post it. Don't be the guy to stoke the flames or any of that yeah. stuff. Um, anyways, I thought I'm just throwing it out there as a helpful tip. It looks like it's cost one hour. Yeah, that should be over at Oh, it's over now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's just a big mess. That's a lot of work, unfortunately. No, no, no. no. And no, we also have just like uh, it's just loud. Right. 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 I'm loud talking to people. Broker tour as well. So review successes, but nothing else about your business will have as big an impact on it as the number of leads you have. There is no business without it. Doctors have no practice if they don't have patients or files. Same thing with dentists and attorney. We're no different. In fact, I think we have a greater opportunity because we people can hold us in high regard if we hold ourselves in high regard and we build off of that. Um, it's just a never-ending success cycle. Oh, you too. You too, Christine. Thank you as well. And then, uh, because I click that, I have to kind of click on this again. Oops. And then an accountability partner. So this is the one I wanted to get into before we head out. Um, choose an accountability partner, provide a safe place to share. I think Veronica and Brenda, you guys have like an awesome relationship going on. If I can share a little, I won't say exactly what, but Brenda called out Veronica on something really cool. I didn't even realize it. I thought, man, that is a really good team. <laughs> But I, I mean that in a good way. I have my, my wife always tell me, oh, game face, game, game face. Like, 
Oh yeah, totally. Because this is like my normal look, right? She's like, "Game face." Like I smile. Game face. I was like, "What's that?" Game face is like you tell them to smile. <laughs> um, follow through with action items. Listen and pay attention. So this is basically creating, you know, having an accountability partner. So people on Zoom, maybe DM someone here from the office, or when you're down here, connect with someone where you can say, hey, I'm going to report in, we're going to do some role play together, whatever the script is. Um, make sure we're hitting our, our top 10 of the, of the day. And then we're back on to our 10 conversations, 10 contacts added. So we're going to take today for 10, and then we're meeting on Wednesday, right? So it's Friday, Monday, Tuesday. So basically 30 conversations, 30 contacts added or edited, 30 hand notes, 30 likes, 30, I guess that would be 15 comments and three posts. Huh? Now keep in mind, if you notice, we, <laughs> we only looked at Friday, Monday, Tuesday, not Saturday, Sunday. Now, as uh, flip the days, right? If if you know Saturday you're doing an open house, well, take Monday off, take Tuesday off, right? But it, here's the honest truth: as a buyer's agent, without listings, I took Monday off or Tuesday off. Monday through Tuesday were kind of like my weekends. As a listing agent, my weekends. As a listing and buyer's agent, my weekends were Wednesday and Thursday, right? Those are my lighter days. Tuesday, Wednesday, those are like my lighter days. I went to grocery shopping, taking kids out to a movie, whatever. Because Saturday, Sunday, I was opening houses, showing homes, all yeah. that stuff, right? And Fridays usually are Mondays. Fridays, Thursdays kind of like Monday. Fridays kind of like, yeah, I guess you could say Fridays like Monday. Yeah. But, you know, Thursday, MLS listings go up. Friday, you're prepping for your showing. Saturday, Friday. Sunday, you're showing homes and you're doing your open house thing, right? So you kind of pick and choose where you're flipping that time. Not, look, we're not going to work 90 straight days in burnout, now, right? That's an immediate fast ticket out of any business. Um, but having built in time that works for you and even showing homes, just show the homes. Don't worry about writing the offers on Saturday or Sunday, you know, prep it with the clients. Like, hey, this is, especially in this market, this is what every listing agent will do. They're going to wait for all offers to come in at Monday at five, or Tuesday at noon or Tuesday at five. You know what? Let's. Think about the homes that we saw today, Cindy, digest it, process it. Let's circle back Monday afternoon or Monday morning and let's talk about some of those homes that we went to go see. And you're like, they're like, oh, cool. And then you're like, awesome. I don't have to sit down and write, you know, six offers on the six homes we saw because the emotions are still high, right? And it's more like by the time Monday or even Sunday rolls around, it's, hey, Phil, we really found about it. Thank you. We only want this one house. Let's go all in. Awesome. Now it's, I can communicate with Erica, who's a listing agent there. And Erica, this is the house that our clients want. What is it in terms of, what can we put in, in terms of terms that would make our offer stand out heads above the rest outside of, of increasing our offer price by 250,000, ha ha, right? And then you tell me, well, we need to close an escrow plus 10. We need, you know, we don't want to give away the appliances. We want to pick all the services, yada, 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 all that stuff. Right. And I make it all in the offer and I make it so that to the point where they have to either counter us or they have to communicate with me and say, okay, you're pretty damn close. This is how much the offer needs to be for it to be the one. Now at least my client Cindy is in the driver's seat to decide her fate when it comes to getting that home or not getting the home. Right. And maybe you get a talk to you, but give, your, give yourself some time off there. Um, awesome guys. So if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. So please make sure you're keeping track of your contacts and you'll see that progression of growth. And you'll also know where your lighter days are. Like, you know, we do stuff at church on Sunday morning. So typically Sunday for us is a lighter day, right? So we know where to kind of put that. Um, we'll get into this next week, but family, occupation, recreation, dreams. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you guys on Zoom and everyone have an amazing weekend. Thank you. Thank you. If you guys are going to Brokers Open, if you have time, go check out Pam's yeah, Brokers yeah, Open.